Welcome to all in Theohumanism land to our first interview of the new academic year. We are going to talk about political theology. What in the world is political theology? To help us figure it all out, we have with us two leading scholars on the topic of political theology. First, we have William Cavanaugh, who is professor of Catholic studies at DePaul University. Bill, welcome to the Theohumanism Project. Thanks, Paul. Good to be here. And we also have with us Vincent Lloyd, who is professor of Africana studies at Villanova University. Vincent, welcome to the Theohumanism Project. Thanks for having me, Paul. Great. Well, let's get right into it. Um, maybe we can begin with you, Bill. Um, what is political theology? Has it always been around? Usually when we think of theology, we think about reflection on the divine. We don't think of reflection on politics. So what, what exactly is political theology? Yeah, so um, I think in the broadest sense, it is reflecting on how societies are organized uh, in the light of what they believe or don't believe about God. Um, I, I, that's a, a rough and ready uh, description. And I think in one sense, in, in a kind of broad sense, political theology has always been around. Um, I mean, speaking of the, the Christian tradition uh, in particular with which I'm most familiar, you know, you've got um, the intersection of what we would divide between politics and theology. You just really, in, in some senses, just don't have those kinds of distinctions. You know, you've got God as king, uh, is, God is proclaimed as king in many of the Psalms. Um, and the king, of course, has kind of liturgical, uh, um, what we would call religious responsibilities. Uh, you look in the Gospels and you've got Jesus coming and proclaiming a kingdom of God uh, is coming uh, to the world and he's executed as king of the Jews and so on. Um, and so these sorts of questions have always been there, especially after uh, the conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine to Christianity in the early fourth century. Um, you have a very tight interrelation between the civil powers and the ecclesiastical powers and, you know, kind of tugs of war uh, amongst them, but no sense that, that there's a, a very easily, uh, you know, marcated line between the responsibilities uh, of the two until much later, uh, really, and, and that's kind of what marks the modern uh, period. In, in a more specific sense, the field of political theology, though, is a 20th century uh, kind of invention. And um, a lot of it kind of crystallizes around Carl Schmitt's book in 1922 uh, called Political Theology, in which he basically argues that um, what we call politics is really just kind of taken over from the theological realm. So the exception uh, in kind of states of exception uh, in the law is the equivalent of miracles, and, and it's all kind of just sort of migrated over from, uh, from the church to the state. Uh, and, and that um, then is kind of taken up by theologians proper in the 1960s, I think, um, to talk about political theology uh, as kind of reflection on um, how societies are organized in the light of Christian faith uh, first, and then I think uh, other kind of uh, political theologies uh, evolve out of that. But in some senses, you only get a field of political theology that is kind of separated out from other fields of theology in the 20th century, precisely at the point when the church in the Western world is losing power. Uh, and so in a lot of ways, it's a sort of, um, it's kind of what happens often when there's a crisis that you have to begin kind of going back to the roots and thinking about um, uh, what this uh, actually means. And so um, I, I think that's kind of one of the ironies of the, the specific field of political theology is that it arises 
when on the one hand you get this sort of divinized uh, states, you know, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany and so on. And on the other hand, you kind of get the loss of political power of um, the church. And so you need to kind of go back and reflect on it anew. Just to, to add a bit to, to what uh, Bill is, is saying, um, one uh, initial observation is that uh, the phrase political theology means a lot of different things in a lot of different contexts. And particularly in the last few years, uh, those uh, usages of the phrase have proliferated uh, in the academy and beyond the academy in, in uh, popular uh, discourse as well. Uh, and to, to just name two um, uh, varieties uh, of um, what's meant by political theology. One is uh, how Christians ought to talk about politics. Right? Uh, Christians do talk about politics uh, and uh, theology could uh, provide a sort of normative discourse, a guide for what ought and what ought not to be said, uh, or, or uh, and thought and done uh, sort of in line with the Christian tradition um, uh, with respect to to uh, political life. So that, that's one one sort of uh, political theology. Uh, another uh, use of the term political theology is just a sort of shorthand for religion and politics more generally, or where the the overlap that part of the Venn diagram where religion and, and politics are uh, are connected, um, and uh, that uh, um, uh, could be approached in a lot of different ways. Uh, I think the people who use the term uh, political theology in this really expansive sense tend to be uh, from the humanities. Uh, they tend to be thinking about uh, ideas and practices approaching through texts, approaching through uh, anth uh, anthropological methods or literary methods or uh, political theory, the sort of history of political ideas, but uh, looking for those sites at which uh, religion and politics uh, overlap. So uh, often some uh, having some resistance to empirical study, to uh, statistics or voting numbers, but uh, using this sort of more humanistic approach uh, to, to that side of overlap. Uh, between these two sorts of extremes, how Christians talk about politics and, uh, or ought to talk about politics and a general site of overlap between religion and politics, uh, there are all sorts of varieties uh, and uh, folks coming from different uh, uh, religious traditions uh, entering the conversation. Uh, if um, uh, th there are conversations in Jewish and Islamic political theology that are also thinking about you know, the normative uh, 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 constraints for talk about politics within those those traditions. There are uh, there's focus on various uh, particular concepts that that are at the intersection of, of religion and politics, from sovereignty to uh, pardon to martyrdom, uh, all, all sorts of. Um, uh, aspects of a religious vocabulary that also have a political resonance and exploring the, the um, how they move between those those registers is, is part of the work of, of political theology. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I find exciting about uh, this um, uh, uh, political theology as a, a name for these multiple conversations is that uh, it's a quite undisciplined space, right, undisciplined space. People are trying out different things. Uh, people are drawing on uh, various traditions, whether it's Augustine, whether it's Carl Schmitt, whether it's uh, traditions of Jewish thinkers, uh, or pushing into, into new, uh, new uh, geographical regions or, or uh, religious traditions that, that haven't previously been part uh, of the conversation, uh, moving from texts to the realm of, of practices, uh, drawing on uh, forms of philosophical and theoretical inquiry uh, that can sharpen and refine uh, the conversation. So there's a lot of uh, energy uh, in the space, which is one of the things that I, I find compelling about it. Yeah, if I could just piggyback on that <clears throat> too. Um, it's interesting to note that, so I, I was kind of talking about it from a sort of Christian political theological uh, point of view, but really the term political theology, I think originates with uh, Michael Bakunin's uh, essay in 1871, to which Schmidt was in some ways uh, responding. And um, for Bakunin, it's political theology is a kind of term, uh, a pejorative term, right? It's it's the, the idea that um, what people um, say is secular is really just kind of masquerading uh, as secular and, and in fact is full of this 
theology, which is, you know, um, just ideology, uh, right? You know, a kind of Marxist, from a Marxist point of view, it's just, um, you know, God is just a projection of false human consciousness, and, and this keeps popping up. Um, so it, it, there's an interesting kind of division between political theology as um, people kind of uh, invested in uh, understanding what belief in the divine might mean for politics. Um, and then there's another tradition of political theology as critique, uh, as kind of um, trying to expose the, uh, the you know, uh, the, uh, false theologies, the kind of false gods that, uh, that are behind uh, different kinds uh, of ideologies. So there's theological, political theology, and then there's, I guess, what would you call it, Vincent, secular political theology or something like that, even though I hate that, that term. Um, but, um, but yeah, so I think Vince, Vincent has done a really nice job of talking about the, the various varieties and the ways that it's a very much contested field. Mm -hmm. Great. So what I've heard is, yeah, there are a lot of streams here in political theology. On the one hand, there's the study of politics through a theological lens, looking at claims to divinity in the public space, but also political theology as a critique, exposing, um, one could say, false deities uh, that, you know, people have embraced uh, in their politics. I guess another question, though, would be, what does political theology add to our understanding of politics? What's the added value? I mean, what does political theology uh, give us about the workings or the meanings or the nature of politics um, that we wouldn't get otherwise from political science or political philosophy? Uh, what's, what's, what's political theology revealing to us about the nature of politics? Uh, Vincent, could I put that over to you? Sure, and maybe I, I'll uh, embrace uh, Bill's uh, division between uh, these two uh, uh, theological political theology and secular political theology uh, in, in addressing this question. Uh, so for the, for the former, um, it uh, is often the case that uh, uh, those of us who have been uh, deeply formed by religious communities and traditions uh, when entering into uh, political uh, discussions uh, or um, uh, engagement uh, are told to or feel like we're uh, pressured to set aside uh, religious commitments uh, and uh, speak and think uh, in a, a sort of flattened uh, secular idiom uh, and uh, in order to be um, understandable to, to our conversation partners in order to be welcoming to, to others uh, in, our, uh, in our polity. Um, and uh, political theology uh, in this first sense, uh, the, the theological uh, sense, uh, authorizes those uh, who are deeply formed by religious uh, traditions and uh, communities uh, to um, refuse that uh, secularism, to bring uh, into uh, political um, analysis, uh, uh, political discernment, uh, political engagement, the virtues, the um, uh, forms of judgment, the um, uh, uh, stories, uh, the uh, beliefs that are integral to our traditions and to, to who we are. Uh, so th that seems like a really important move, uh, and in this uh, spirit of theohumanism, to bring the whole human into, into political engagement if the, those religious commitments are formative of, of the, the human. Uh, I, in the, the second uh, sort of uh, political theology, that is the sort of a, a critique of uh, uh, secular uh, politics uh, that is coming from a uh, ideology critical uh, place. Um, there, there's uh, certainly a, a worry uh, on the part of uh, those uh, scholars and activists uh, who uh, care about racism and patriarchy and colonialism and empire and militarism and the, the various uh, collective vices of our of our, our nation and our age um, 
there, there's a worry that uh, secularism or a secular frame for political uh, conversations um, plays into those collective vices, right? That uh, the uh, secularism, um, uh, the exclusion of religious reasons, uh, religious uh, beliefs and, and reasons and uh, forms of engagement uh, complements uh, uh, the, um, the uh, fits in with the uh, these ideologies, that is the, the failure to take seriously racial difference, uh, the failure to take seriously uh, 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 women's experience and trans experience uh, and queer experience. Uh, uh, if the political uh, frame excludes religious experience, it's also going to uh, exclude these other sorts of experiences. Uh, and uh, that, that's a, that can be a problem, that can be doing uh, 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 violence uh, to uh, the, uh, you know, our, our fellow citizens uh, and, and neighbors. Uh, as, uh, so naming secularism is a problem and a, a problem that um, may be concealing these other problems uh, is, uh, you know, has, has power in, in, in that, that, that sense um, as well. And of, of course, um, uh, in our moment where conversations uh, about politics have shifted from being necessarily reformist uh, to uh, putting on the table reform and abolition, reform and revolution, reform and radical transformation, uh, it becomes clearer and clearer that uh, the secular frame that has uh, long dominated uh, politics is one that's invested in that reformist framework. And if our commitment, uh, our political commitments are, are such that you know, we, uh, want to at least consider the possibility that for some uh, political uh, corners of our political life, an abolitionist or revolutionary or deeply transformative frame is necessary, uh, allowing the uh, religious forms of uh, political engagement that um, uh, support that, that uh, sort of abolition, abolitionist or revolutionary frame, um, you know, encouraging those to, those to be part of a conflict, our, those to be part of our conversation seems uh, really, really uh, essential. You've brought in that idea of the prophetic voice as really important um, for pushing forward reforms and, uh, and transformative perspectives in the public sphere, that idea that religion brings a prophetic voice. And so political theology, as it were, allows that voice to come to the fore in a way that it might not otherwise. Um, Bill, maybe I could turn it to you. Where, where do you see political theology as offering added value to our understanding of politics? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that was coming out to me as, as Vincent was talking is the, uh, the way in which political theology can help level the playing field um, between so-called religious and so-called secular, so that um, we're often trained uh, into these ways of thinking in which there are believers and then there are uh, unbelievers. So there are some people that have beliefs and then there are other people that have facts, right? And so political science fancies itself as a science. And so they deal with facts and then theology is this, you know, land of fantasy where people believe in things that are impossible to prove and that sort of thing. And so um, one of the things that political theology does, I think, is really kind of help level that playing field. Like when I teach Hobbes, um, you know, when I, when I learned Hobbes uh, coming up as an undergraduate, Hobbes was kind of the beginning of, uh, you know, modern political uh, theory, and so you didn't really read all of the stuff that he wrote in the Bible on, uh, on the Bible in Leviathan. You just ignored that stuff, and you saw him as kind of this hard-headed realist who, you know, builds up a political theory from a realistic view of the, the human, you know, predicament as being, you know, um, uh, what's what's the, the it's um, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, right? Which I always thought was, a, that would be a great uh, name for a law firm. Uh, but um, uh, when I teach it, I kind of teach it alongside Genesis. 
and show that what they're both trying to do is very much the same kind of thing, that they're both trying to understand the predicament that we've gotten that humans are in and understand uh, how we uh, get out of it. Like what's, what's there in the beginning? Uh, how, do, how do things fall apart? Uh, and then what do we do to uh, get out of it? And I think once you understand it in those kinds of frames, then you understand more about what Hobbes was really up to and you understand more about what anybody who's doing political theory or political science uh, is up to kind of telling these stories about uh, human beings and their relationship with something beyond uh, as a way of trying to understand the predicament um, that we're in and how to organize ourselves to get out of it. Um, and so th that I think is, is helpful for uh, leveling the playing field. Um, and somebody, you know, I think about, uh, so the, I, I'm coming from the, the first of Vincent's types, you know, the kind of theological, uh, political theology. Um, and then coming from the other type, the sort of, uh, for lack of a better word, secular uh, political theology, you can get somebody like Paul Kahn and uh, his kind of uh, redoing of Schmidt's book on political theology uh, where what he's, he's uh, not a uh, Christian or a Jew, as far as I understand, um, but what he's trying to bring to the table is an understanding of the way that the United States is, is a sacrificial kind of polity where people will sacrifice themselves uh, and be sacrificed for uh, this abstraction called the nation state. And we're you know, the, the use of nuclear weapons, we are prepared to obliterate all life on earth in order to protect these borders that were kind of recently and arbitrarily created and so on. And so he think coming from the other point of view, um, wants us to see what we're not often seeing when we're looking at these things as if they were just sort of, um, you know, mundane uh, processes that um, what in fact is going on are these Kind of large narratives of um, who human beings are and what our destiny is and what our common destiny is and these sort of transcendent uh, kind of uh, goals um, which he may eventually think are all illusory but um, but what it does again is kind of le level uh, the playing field where we can see that uh, it's not it's just not the case that there are these kind of rational, sober, mundane people on the one side, and then there's people that believe crazy stuff on the other side, um, but that the um, those types of people are very much uh, intermingled. And that's what I think both, both types of political theology help to do. Yeah, what I'm hearing there is that in one way, political theology is helping us get over the excesses of modernity or you know, the myopic view of modernity that would kind of reduce everything to these secular scientific categories, when in fact the realities that are shaping us um, are much more expansive and, yeah, even, you know, difficult to identify with um, the empirical realm alone, I guess. We can turn now uh, to the American uh, context, and I know for many of us, and certainly for my students, uh, they'd be interested to know how political theology can help us understand ourselves as a nation, right? Uh, in general, one could say that Americans have a rather, um, you know, positive sense, optimistic sense of ourselves as a nation, although that's kind of come under serious critique in recent years. Uh, but we're, you know, a nation with a destiny, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I guess, I don't know, I mean, from what I've heard so far, I mean, we can think theologically about politics. And so I guess, how would we think theologically about our nation or, um, I guess what would, what, 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 what would thinking theologically about our nation actually, um, open up to us about who we are as a nation? What would that reveal to us if we start thinking theologically about ourselves as a nation? Um, Vincent, could I throw that over to you? Sure. Um, 
so on some very uh, small uh, on a, and specific uh, levels, we can see the way that um, theological thinking uh, still shapes the way that uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, government and legal system work, the pardon power of the president or of a governor uh, is uh, uh, clearly uh, parallel to the power of a sovereign god to uh, suspend the laws of nature. Uh, and um, uh, even, if the, even if that parallel is rarely, if ever, spoken about, um, the, the sovereignty of the, the governor or, or president um, uh, has uh, this um, uh, almost self-evidently theological uh, uh, connotation that, that goes along with it, uh, which could be uh, which could provide an opening, right, uh, for uh, discussions of abuse of power, of constraint, uh, of of uh, sovereign authority, of whether um, you know uh, embracing this analogy is healthy or unhealthy. Uh, to, uh, in terms of uh, promoting the common good uh, of, of a nation uh, or of a, of a, a state. Um, but it, uh, it, uh, noticing that uh, analogy uh, between um, uh, theological reasoning and uh, political reasoning uh, opens the door to uh, those sorts of conversations uh, about um, uh, whether that's healthy or unhealthy or, and, and the constraints needed and so on. Uh, in American political discourse, uh, the, uh, it, there's so much um, religious and particularly Christian language that uh, it, it's easy to forget about that faith, hope, and love are the primary virtues uh, put forward by every president or not uh, almost every presidential candidate or that are a staple of the, the political uh, uh, lexicon um, suggest uh, that uh, um, some version of uh, particularly uh, Christian uh, uh, ideas and uh, ways of living uh, are informing uh, at least the rhetoric of American politics. And again, once we notice that, that point of connection, we can ask, uh, is the faith, hope, and love that someone like Obama talks about or someone like Reagan talks about, you know, how does that fit or misfit with faith, hope, and love as Augustine talks about or as uh, Dorothy Day talks about uh, within the Christian uh, tradition. Um, from uh, another perspective, one might wonder uh, if one uh, is a, um, a Christian or a any other, uh, you know, coming from any other sort of religious uh, uh, tradition, formed by some other religious tradition, uh, and starting to think about uh, political engagement. You know, is America the, the proper uh, uh, framework for thinking about politics, right? Uh, if politics is uh, you know, about how we uh, live together, about how uh, we can advance the, the, the common good, uh, is the, the scale of the nation the appropriate scale uh, for having those conversations? Um, uh, or might uh, there be smaller and larger scales, that is a sort of local uh, or community or church uh, sort of size or scale uh, that would be a healthier starting point. And what would it mean for our political conversations to make electoral politics and national politics subordinate uh, to uh, that sort of local or cosmopolitan uh, kind, of, uh, kind of vision? It's certainly easy to see um, how much Christian language uh, and often Jewish language too has uh, permeated uh, American politics. And when you go to Europe, you oftentimes uh, encounter people who assume that the reason our politics are so crazy in the US is because we still have so much Christianity around, right? We're relatively high although dropping rapidly uh, rates of church attendance and that sort of thing. Whereas a place like um, Sweden assumes that they kind of left that behind a, a long time ago. And we've just, uh, the Americans have not quite caught up uh, yet. Um, what political theology can bring to that conversation though, I think is seeing the ways in which um, uh, it's, it's not, just 
Christianity in kind of unadulterated form, but there's been a sort of migration of the holy, uh, in John Bossie's phrase, from the church to the nation, and the nation itself has taken on some of these kind of uh, um, divine trappings, right? And so Bossy is talking about it in, in terms of Europe and kind of early modern Europe, where you get um, uh, the kind of divinization of kings and so on. Um, but then there's, you know, from the 19th century onward, you also get the divinization of the nation, the kind of sacredness of the nation and the idea of na nationalism as a religion, which a lot of scholars of nationalism talk about, you know, Carlton Hayes and Durkheim and Robert Bella and Anthony D. Smith and so on, this idea that the nation itself becomes uh, a, a kind of God um, or in another sense, a, a, a kind of church. And so um, I think that really helps to think about the American context that it's not, um, Robert Bella th talked about his famous article about civil religion in America, where our public, our private faith is Christianity, as he's writing in 1967, um, and our public faith is American civil religion, um, in which you have this kind of Unitarian God uh, that um, is identified with the projects of, of the nation. Uh, and I think that's a really helpful uh, thing when you see that theology is not just uh, what uh, Christians say and do explicitly with regard to the Bible and so on, and there's plenty of that. Uh, but there's also this kind of implicit theology uh, in in the sort of divinization of uh, of the nation, uh, and that goes on in the United States and many other uh, nations uh, as well. Carolyn Marvin says that um, nationalism is the most powerful religion in the United States and many other countries uh, as well. Nationalism is the most powerful religion in the United States. And that um, is one of the ways that, that political theology, I think, can, can bring something interesting uh, to the conversation. You both use the term idolatry in your writings uh, in general, and I think also in reference to the American context. So, um, yeah, Bill, maybe first to follow up with you, since you kind of put us in this position or this kind of direction in our conversation, um, nationalism as our strongest religion, um, I mean, it would suggest that we're worshiping something that's not God. Um, but I guess more specifically, I mean, in your writings, you do seem to connect um, idolatry or the way you talk about it, you seem to connect it to modernity itself, that somehow modern politics and modern uh, economics has become our replacement deities, or that somehow um, the modern perspective on life has kind of um, kind of incapacitated us uh, to think um, beyond the material, the empirical, and so on and so forth, and so that we can't any longer grasp, as it were, the truth of divinity. Um, and you even suggest, if I've understood you in your writings, that this can have harmful uh, consequences for our personal well-being. We can fetishize consumer products, for example. Um, so, I mean, maybe I could just ask you to clarify what you mean by idolatry in referring to um, the uh, politics of the nation or the economics of the nation. Uh, but also, I mean, if if that idolatry, as you understand it, is harmful, I mean, you know, in what way do we really need to um, bring political theology to um, correcting those uh, perspectives that actually can harm people? Yeah, so um, uh, I'm actually writing a book on idolatry now, and I'm trying to do it in a little more sympathetic way than my kind of swashbuckling, fist-shaking <laughs> ways that, you know, uh, it, uh, of my youth. But um, I mean, in general, so idolatry is a very old idea, and it's just the idea that people um, 
have a tendency to worship all sorts of things or have an inordinate devotion to all sorts of things that are not God, that are just created things. And oftentimes this just ends up, uh, these sorts of things, the, the little gods that we create end up dominating us uh, and, and that has dire consequences. Um, and so, um, uh, so from a theological point of view, I think that could describe uh, a lot of what's um, going on in any era, really. Um, uh, but the, the per peculiarly modern um, form of this, in some ways, uh, is the, the sort of this migration, I think, from uh, explicit worship of God to a sort of implicit worship of, um, you know, the invisible hand of the market or the nation state, uh, those, those kinds of things. Um, and this is not to say that it used to be better, you know, it's not to have a kind of nostalgia for the Middle Ages and say oh, everything was great uh, back then, um, because it, it, the most important thing about idolatry is that it doesn't really matter that much what you say you believe, it's what your actions reveal about your implicit beliefs. So it doesn't matter that much if people, you know, no law in the West uh, at a much lower rate say they believe in God than they used to, right? Um, what's really interesting is what people's actions actually reveal about uh, their beliefs. And, you know, people are good and bad in, in, in all ages. Um, but there's a lot of empirical work that's been done by non-theologians, which show this kind of movement uh, uh, towards the, like Ernest Gellner's work, kind of movement where when Christendom falls apart, the repository of uh, the sacred becomes the nation and the nation state. And this becomes what people will kill and die for. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, that's another one of Carol and Marvin's points is, is basically there can only be one true uh, public religion, and it's the one that people are willing to kill and die for. Hardly anybody will kill for Jesus anymore, but people will kill for the for the flag, you know, for the nation state all the time. And that I think is a is a really important uh, point. And 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 then in the economic realm, I mean, this is something that Marx I think saw pretty clearly: the kind of fetishization of commodities. That um, and it's very interesting the way that you get. Um, an anticipation of what he says about commodity fetishism in the Bible. You know, for Marx, commodities take on uh, life, right? So the Amazon boxes with the big smiles sing and dance. Um, and in the meantime, life is being sucked out of the people that are actually working in the Amazon warehouse, right? Um, that's what Marx talks about, the, the commodity, the fetishization of commodities. And you've got that already in Psalm 115, right, where, where they talk about the people that are making idols are kind of putting life into these lifeless art, articles and uh, life is being drained uh, out of them. Um, and so um, th in, in those ways, I think, um, the, the, the idolatry critique um, can be helpful, but I want to see also this kind of sympathetic mm -hmm. idea that um, the reason people are spontaneously idolatrous is because we're all looking for something that transcends us, right? And, and you see this kind of sympathy in uh, Paul's speech to the Athenians in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, he says he's kind of horrified by their idolatry, but then he calls them extremely religious, you know, deesi daimon esteros, because uh, they're constantly sort of reaching out um, for, uh, for the divine, and, um, and, and, and he's got all this beautiful language about, um, you know, how we share uh, this common sense uh, with with people of what what we live and move and have our being in and so on, um, and and I think that's um, that's another way of kind of I mean ironically then I, I, idolatry critique, which is oftentimes uh, something very divisive, 
uh, and very self-righteous and saying, you don't worship like we do, and so you're idolaters and so on. Um, it also has this kind of other sort of dynamic in which it can be this kind of leveling of the playing field. It's a recognition that we all worship and we all worship badly. And, um, and then there's, there, there's this kind of uh, moment in there of, um, of sympathy that you often find. You, you find it in the, sometimes in the, the scriptures uh, as well, like in the, the Wisdom of Solomon, where it talks about, you know, things are beautiful. And so people uh, put their devotion in them because God has made these beautiful things. And, uh, and I think that's really um, uh, true, that we all make meaning out of the material things in our lives. Mary Douglas's work, I think, brings this forth uh, great. Um, and the trick is then trying to keep uh, that from eating us alive, right? Um, uh, the novelist David Foster Wallace, his famous commencement speech at Kenyon College in 2005 says, in the actual trenches of everyday life, there's no such thing as atheists. Everybody worships, and the only choice we get is what to worship. And the reason you might want to worship a god or something like that is because everything else you worship will eat you alive. You know, worship money and you'll never have enough. You worship your looks and you'll always feel ugly and so on. Um, and that's a very kind of biblical uh, idea, I think. And so... Um, Idolatry is never, is very rarely a kind of either or, a black and white issue. It's, it's most often kind of on a continuum, and it takes a lot of discernment to, to kind of figure out when it is that our devotion to this beautiful world around us and to other people, when that kind of becomes something that um, becomes destructive rather than life-giving. I'm looking forward to, to that idol idolatry book, uh, Bill, uh, very much. Um, yeah, and I, I don't have much much more to add. I, I would just uh, sort of underscore a couple of things that, that, that Bill said. Um, one, uh, that um, it's uh, both um, quite uh, intuitive and powerful to notice that uh, the kind of devotion uh, that some give to God, others give to a nation. Uh, and once we notice that, um, uh, it uh, primes us to see other sort of sites of excess devotion, uh, whether that's wealth uh, or uh, forms of ma masculinity or uh, forms of whiteness uh, or uh, thinking about uh, uh, the environmental catastrophe, cars and air conditioning and, and a, a, sort of a set of uh, uh, practices uh, that are um, daily doing violence to, to the earth uh, and that receive our excessive devotion. Um, so a, as a kind of method, there's a, a lot of power uh, here, uh, both because there's um, we, we have a common intuition uh, about uh, uh, this sort of misplaced devotion once, once we can notice it and that, that there's something amiss there. But also, uh, as, as Bill was uh, so eloquently saying, that uh, um, the Christian tradition and many other religious traditions have uh, many, many uh, resources uh, for uh, uh, discerning and challenging uh, exactly this, right? Idolatry, exactly this sort of misplaced devotion. Uh, so by um, uh, allowing those uh, traditions to be part of our political conversation, uh, we uh, um, are able to access um, those resources for, for um, uh, the kind of uh, social justice projects that, that uh, could bring together uh, both um, religious um, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, th th those who are religious and those who, who understand themselves as, uh, as secular, uh, those who, who um, see themselves in, in hard left or sort of Marxian traditions and are looking for ideology also uh, have a, a resource here and that um, uh, these various idols are uh, not, don't stand alone, but stand in connection to each other. Right? Uh, the, the sort of a religion of uh, idols uh, is a kind of ideology, right? A set of ideas that uh, gives us this, uh, makes us, uh, 
uh, apply excessive devotion to, to certain objects uh, and certain uh, concepts. And, and so this project of uh, ideology critique uh, that's so uh, uh, famous and uh, well-developed uh, and the secular, secular left uh, can come into conversation with traditions of idolatry critique from, from uh, Christianity and elsewhere. Um, and just to, to add one more point here, a uh, 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 sort of uh, paradigm of idolatry, another paradigm of idolatry uh, has to do with domination, right? That uh, to uh, dominate is to uh, set oneself up as a God, right? Uh, as a Lord uh, over another. Uh, and as, uh, you know, uh, our national conversation in the U.S. is uh, focusing more and more on slavery and its afterlives, the, the continuing effects of slavery, not only on uh, Black Americans, but on um, the uh, economic system of the U.S. and of institutions within the U.S. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, connected with uh, questions of colonialism and neocolonialism neocolonial globally. Um, thinking about uh, domination, right? Th this uh, relationship, which is at the very root of slavery uh, as a, a paradigm of idolatry or the paradigm of idolatry, one human setting themselves up as Lord uh, seems really um, productive uh, for uh, imagining how we can challenge uh, those, those uh, systems of domination, which persist today uh, mindful of Bill's uh, also a great a great point there that um, uh, which I, which I'll put a, a more negative spin on uh, uh, we all dominate and we all are dominated in different ways right? uh, and uh, e examining our uh, the, the the various ways in which we participate in relationships of domination uh, is. Uh, always ongoing, um, never ending, and closely related to the, this project of idolatry critique. There's a lot of material on idolatry that concentrates on idolatry as a kind of narcissism, right? You know, eat of this and you will be like gods, right? You know, um, and, um, and there's some interesting stuff on nationalism as collective narcissism. Uh, and I think that rubric applies to racism uh, in a in a kind of obvious way, right? It's the it's the seeing your own reflection. It's worshiping your own reflection in the mirror. Uh, this kind of collective narcissism of my group is you know the it, it is godlike, and the others are demonic and and other in in whatever ways. Um, and so um, uh, idolatry as kind of self worship. And idolatry critique then needs to be self-critique primarily. And I think what you find that in the scriptures as well, when most of the time that they're in the, in the Old Testament, when they're denouncing idolatry, it's denouncing the idolatry of the Israelites themselves. And I think that's probably the place that we ought to start is, is with self-critique. I'd like to explore this a little bit more, uh, this idea of um, idolatry or the critique of idolatry as domination. Um, Vincent, especially regarding, if I've understood it right, your interest in um, renewing Black theology. And so it seems to me that this critique of idolatry as domination has something to do um, in relation to your interest in the renewal of Black theology. Uh, but I'd like to tie it to what I've understood for your reason uh, from your re uh, I'd like to tie it to what I've understood from your writings as this um, uh, this equation or this association of idolatry with with the secular as as false consciousness. And so I wonder if you could explain that a little bit. I mean, isn't, you know, the secular one point of view and the religious one point of view? Why is one false and the other not false, too? Or why is one less false or 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 not false? Um, so if you could explain to us um, or uh, help us understand um, what you mean by that uh, sense of idolatry, uh, where you call the secular a false consciousness, and, and maybe you could speak a little bit how that plays into your idea of uh, renewing Black theology. I think sometimes in conversations about uh, 
secularity, secularization, secularism, the secular uh, words float uh, around uh, loosely, which uh, can, can be quite uh, uh, healthy to help us um, notice new connections, um, but it can also get confusing, especially for, for uh, students and, and those uh, who are sort of just entering into a, a conversation. Um, and uh, so when I think of secularization, I think of a historical process uh, in which um, religion is uh, being confined to a, a particular sphere of life and uh, it's a shrinking uh, a sphere of life, um, religious uh, adherence, those who enter into that religious corner of, of life or of the world uh, are, are dwindling in number uh, as part of secularization. Uh, secularism, I think of as um, a set of ideas that uh, try and wall off um, uh, our world or part of our world from religion or from 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 the religious in in some way, uh, and when uh, we're thinking uh, about the um, uh, complex realities of uh, human life, uh, and uh, I guess echoing again you, the the theo humanism uh, framing here, uh, uh, realities of human life that are. Uh, inexplicable in, uh, ultimately inexplicable in secular terms, right? That there are mysteries, there are uh, uh, paradoxes, there are uh, points at which we are rendered silent, uh, whether it is by birth or death, by friendship, by love, uh, by uh, uh, home, by exile, right? Th these are all uh, sites at which uh, a, um, uh, language which excludes the religious will be inadequate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, th that that sort of puts pressure on uh, the secular frame in which our, our conversations about politics or, or culture happen. Uh, and I, I think this is particularly uh, you know, felt particularly uh, acutely in uh, spaces around uh, black culture uh, in which uh, the uh, experience of slavery and, of, and its afterlives, the experience of domination, uh, whether it's on a, a, a grand scale in terms of uh, police murder uh, or slavery itself, uh, or on a small scale in terms of microaggressions uh, or in, in terms of um, you know, the job opportunities or environmental racism, uh, uh, all of these um, uh, experiences are uh, pushing up against uh, the, the limits of language, pushing up against the limits of uh, the concepts and uh, ways of seeing that the dominant U.S. culture uh, ha makes available. Uh, and so when, when we're pu pushing up against those limits of language, when we're, we're pushing up uh, against the limits of the, the ways of seeing that the, 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 the world authorizes, um, uh, that's when uh, uh, forms of religious talk and imagining and singing and praying become all the more important. Right? Uh, and that, that's what traditions of Black theology have uh, spoken to, right? uh, have responded to. Uh, and uh, I think um, uh, at its best, Black theology, whether in an academic context or in an ecclesial context, uh, or in an extra ecclesial context, just in the uh, sort of uh, uh, conversations between uh, folks waiting for the train, talking about their spiritual lives, right? All of those um, those sorts of uh, uh, experiences um, uh, powerfully uh, challenge the the secular frame in which much of white America lives uh, and uh, or is uh, forced into. Um, and deserves, uh, you know, the, the, those sorts of uh, forms of Black theology uh, deserve more uh, attention. Sometimes the academy tries to domesticate those forms of Black theology and sort of translate them into languages that are legible uh, to either a white theological uh, frame, which ultimately is, it can be quite complicit in, in secular forms of uh, of reasoning or translate black theology just into black politics or black culture, uh, losing the specifically theological and specifically Christian content uh, of um, uh, much black uh, religious discourse. Uh, and those, those are things I, I worry about. 
if I could just uh, focus on a particular point here and then maybe Bill will have some commentary. Um, in some of your writings, Vincent, you talk about the love of God as really important in this sense um, that somehow, as you said, the limits of language and all of that. And so the love of God is so important as a kind of, uh, you know, assurance against the dehumanization of the human being, the dehumanization of the black human being in particular. Um, and so I guess, I mean, if I've understood you correctly, the love of God is really uh, important in terms of somehow ensuring uh, the coherency of society where everyone is seen as dignified, as possessed of dignity, um, because they're objects of God's love, as it were. And so um, I don't know if you want to clarify that. Maybe I've not completely understood it, but if you like to kind of um, kind of expand on that idea, um, how important that is uh, for our humanity. And if so, I mean, should that then become part of our civic discourse if it's important for really kind of guarding against the dehumanization of, of who we are? Um, should it become part of our civic discourse, the love of God, if not actually a governmental policy? Uh, thanks, yeah, lots, lots of tricky questions there. And I, I think uh, it's also helpful to distinguish between um, political rhetoric uh, and um, uh, which is meant to persuade people and which is meant to um, speak a, a language that connects, right? Uh, connects with um, what people are familiar with and, and uh, what sort of brings out uh, uh, intuitions and feelings in, in people's hearts, um, uh, but it can also distract or distort um, political rhetoric from uh, the uh, sorts of um, uh, uh, political uh, phenomena or orientations uh, that that we ultimately want to uh, elicit or cultivate. So by that I mean, you know, there's a lot of talk about love. Right? Uh, it's hard to talk about love in a serious way, uh, given uh, the the pop uh, pop music um, that that uh, trivializes love. Given the the way that uh, love circulate, the language of love circulates, you know, in in everyday. Um, uh, uh, American life. Um, so uh, while uh, love of God and, uh, you know, the thing that, that I think you're trying to point to with the language of love of God seems really important and valuable and, um, uh, and revolutionary in, in some ways, uh, it, it seems quite context uh, dependent whether uh, 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 naming that thing, right, uh, love will uh, distract uh, or uh, will um, uh, do what we wanted to do. That is, you know, elicit from people's hearts, right? The, a kind of right orientation toward the good, the true, and the beautiful. It does seem to me that um, you've got paradigms coming out of the Black church for how to do uh, this kind of language um, that are really uh, valuable. I mean, paradigmatically from the civil rights movement, but but beyond that as well. But you know, Martin Luther King had a way where he could talk about Lincoln and talk about Jesus in the same sentence, and um, and it made sense, and it didn't make you want to run the other direction. <laughs> and there are other people these days that um, can you know, use almost the same language and, and it makes you suspicious. And a lot of it just, of course, depends, like Vincent was saying, on the context and specifically on whether you are trying to get power or whether you're trying to lift up the powerless, right? Um, and what kind of, you know, what for what purpose and, and so on. So um, so in, in that way, I think um, uh, the... Black church kind of coming out of a place of powerlessness uh, and in this prophetic voice um, is something that we, um, uh, you know, that, that's paradigmatic. We've talked about so many things and uh, when you come and visit us uh, in about a month's time, uh, we're going to have so many questions for you uh, and we're really looking forward to that. But why don't we wrap up our online discussion here and think about the theme of our discussion series this year, which is theology and religious studies in service of national healing. And so I want to bring it back to political theology, and you can answer this in any way that makes sense. Um, but how does political theology 
um, how can political theology be a source of healing for our nation at this very divided time, even existentially divided time? Can it help us uh, see a common purpose? Uh, can it facilitate conversations across group affinities? Um, can it help us see uh, the nation uh, as one in some sense? Um, in what way, I guess, would you suggest that political theology could be a source of healing for us as a nation in this uh, divided moment? Uh, Bill, do you want to take it? Sure. Um, I guess part of the uh, issue is what kind of people that we are, right? I mean, we talk about freedom all the time. Uh, and we tend to talk about it in negative terms. Freedom means I get to do what I want without interference from other people. Um, but that's a really incomplete idea of freedom. That's just a negative freedom, freedom from interference. Um, and there's a stronger sense of a positive freedom um, that we are freer the more that we're kind of wrapped up in the will of God and wrapped up in, in each other's uh, lives, right? Um, and I think even some of the, you know, I think James Madison recognizes this in the Federalist Papers too, that you can't have um, free to, a free society without virtuous citizens, right? They have to be people that are trained in certain virtues in order to live freedom well. Um, and that's something that I think we often uh, lose sight of. And that's some, a place where I think theology can be of service, is forming us as people who tell the truth. Uh, and in, in that sense, um, I'm always a little bit wary when the goal is national unity and who we are as a people and that sort of thing. I mean, I get the point, but in some ways, I think that the best way to serve the nation is by not making serving the nation our goal, right? Um, that when you serve something higher than the nation, when you serve the truth with a capital T, when you serve God, then um, uh, then you serve the nation better than if you're trying to serve the nation. The, there has to be something greater than just the we of our collective narcissism uh, in order for the we to work, right? So in order for there to be a kind of community that works, then we have to be uh, serving a higher purpose and recognizing a kind of higher purpose. And I think uh, that's uh, one way in which political theology can help. And if I could just add a, a, a little bit there, although I, I'd uh, affirm or second uh, uh, what, what Bill has just been saying, um, I think sometimes the, the uh, metaphor of healing uh, doesn't, in, we don't think uh, through the metaphor enough, right? So uh, we stop by thinking uh, healing means you're sick and you take medicine and then you're better. but uh, people get all sorts of really serious sicknesses, right? Sometimes people need surgery. Sometimes people need chemotherapy. Sometimes people need amputation, right? There, there can be a really um, uh, um, dangerous and sometimes devastating um, uh, responses uh, that are uh, uh, intended for healing and that sometimes lead to, to healing just in, in, the, in the, the medical realm. Uh, and that, that does seem apt when, when thinking about a, a deeply sickened and pathological uh, uh, nation and, and national culture, right? That uh, uh, to uh, look for the pill, right, uh, may, may be the, the wrong metaphor, but to uh, remember that the, the kind of healing that might be necessary might be uh, almost gruesome. Um, uh, and yet uh, still done uh, in the interest of uh, restoring health uh, and uh, with the, the good of the, the nation in mind. Um, uh, uh, th that, that seems like a, a really um, uh, complex and difficult uh, 
process and metaphor to struggle with, right? Because we also worry about instrumentalizing, right? We worry about uh, uh, taking uh, actions that um, are in the uh, interest of a good, but are themselves uh, oriented away from the good uh, and um, uh, are, are um, thus, uh, uh, it, it, and it may be unclear whether uh, we're really going to get the, the, this good result we want in the long term, right? Which is all just to say that, that, that uh, this healing metaphor seems important, but also uh, it's necessary to really struggle with. Um, just one more aspect of the, this healing metaphor has to do with authority and expertise, right? There's someone who has special expertise who's doing the healing, uh, whereas what uh, I think the, the metaphor is uh, uh, intended to, to get at is a sense that we're healing ourselves, uh, that uh, we all have the capacity um, when we uh, imagine collectively, when we discern collectively to engage in a kind of self-healing work that isn't based on special expertise, which is also putting more, more pressure on, on the metaphor. Uh, but again, pressure that's worth, worth thinking through and, and um, worth struggling with. Uh, political theology, uh, it, it seems, um, you know, helps in, in, in all of these dimensions, uh, whether it's a tool uh, to, to do some really deep healing work, uh, whether uh, it is, um, uh, a diagnostic process, whether it is a uh, sort of um, a, a lifestyle prescription for healing um, that uh, uh, only works in the long term but requires practice um, uh, uh, on the everyday basis for a long time. Um, th those all seem like, like uh, powerful ways that, that political theology um, can, can be part of uh, national uh, healing but especially um, when our democratic values are under pressure, uh, are put in question, uh, it seems um, uh, so important to uh, be able to uh, reject forms of um, theological uh, expertise with respect to politics while embracing the, the uh, ordinary uh, um, possibilities uh, of uh, religious uh, thought and life and practice. Um, that is, uh, I, I worry that um, political theology can set itself up as a, an expert uh, with, uh, th th that can go heal the nation. Um, and instead, political theology at its best is saying, Look around, there are all sorts of communities, all sorts of families, all sorts of um, uh, neighborhoods that are uh, bringing uh, their religious traditions, their forms of seeing the world, their forms of uh, speaking and singing and praying uh, to build a better life together. And uh, that's where we ought to turn to, to learn how to heal the nation. Wow, if I've understood both of you, uh, political uh, theology as a medicine of a kind, um, if the nation's ready to take this healing process, it could really shake the national body in a way. Uh, but that would be, as it were, required for it to shake uh, some of its diseases. Uh, so, wow. Um, thank you both so much. It's clear that political theology just has such a powerful future. Um, in the coming years, thanks to the work that the two of you are doing and many others. And we so look forward to having you at Georgetown in about a month's time, both the department and my students. They're gonna be benefiting so much uh, from your insights and this type of conversation. So, uh, Bill, thank you very much. Vincent, thank you, Paul. Vincent, thank you very much. And we thank look forward to seeing you both in a month's time.